Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with About Face, where we are going to be talking about facial difference. We are joined by three panelists. We have Colleen, Annie, and Christine joining us today. So we will jump right into it and start with our presentation. I'm just going to share. Before we begin, we're going to start with a land acknowledgement. About Face is committed to inclusion and diversity in keeping with Indigenous practices and building respectful relationships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples of Canada. We want to recognize the traditional territories or ancestral lands of the Indigenous people. Since we are meeting virtually, I would like to recognize that the Indigenous people are the traditional keepers of the lands and the waters where each of us are joining from. I also do this in the hopes that it inspires you to learn more about the land and the people who took care of this land long before we got here. If you'd like to learn more about the land, you can call or text the location to this number here, and you can also find more information on the website native-land.ca. If you've never been to a Zoom webinar before, we're just going to go over a couple of housekeeping things. Only the panelists and the hosts are visible on the screen. You, the participants, will not have access to any video, but you can participate using the chat and the Q&A. We encourage you to use the chat throughout the webinar for participation and then any of the questions that you might have to put those in the Q&A so that we can keep track and get those answered as we go along. We can provide any specific advice or counseling, so if you have any questions that may be considered this, we will direct you to your healthcare team. So now we're going to introduce the panelists. As mentioned, we are joined by Colleen, Christine, and Annie today. I'll hand it over to them to introduce themselves, their name, their pronouns, and their experience with facial difference, and the first pivotal conversation they remember having with facial difference. All right, I guess I can start. So my name is Colleen Wheatley. Um, I am a social worker and I have been involved with About Face since I was 11, so it's been quite a while. I've had the opportunity to be a volunteer, to be a staff member, and then be a volunteer and now back as kind of a consultation um, social worker with the team, which is really great. Uh, so my experience is I grew up with a hemangioma, uh, which I, I kind of explain as a birthmark on the side of my face. And actually, it was funny as we were talking about this and we were kind of talking about some of the conversations we've had as our family. And I suppose this might be dating myself a little bit. So I can remember I also have a dog with a cough in the background. Apologies. <laughs> she's, she's OK. She just has a cough. Um, but uh, I can remember being introduced to About Face, actually, with a VHS video. Um, and that was one of kind of the first times my family, I, not the first time we talked about my facial difference, but we talked about about face and it really gave us tools and a vocabulary. And I can specifically remember, uh, I can picture uh, the people on screen who later on, some of them I got to meet, um, talking about how we can be different on the outside, but we're all people on the inside. Um, and then really from that, you know, it was really a normal part of our conversation. And a lot of it was actually focused around the work we did with About Face. Uh, so that was a really great tool that uh, my family used to talk about my facial difference. Can I pass it on to Annie, please? And my pronouns are she, her. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you, Colleen. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Annie and my pronouns are she and her. And I've been involved with the boat face for several years now. I have a daughter who is 13 and she was born with a facial difference. She was born with clipophile syndrome and part of that syndrome encompasses uh, facial differences. So the first time I remember having a conversation specifically about facial difference were, was when Sophie was about and she was noticing that people were staring at her and, and noticing her. And uh, from that, we did see a counselor who specialized with craniofacial differences. And that individual said to us, well, uh, have, have you told Sophie that she has a facial difference? And uh, my husband and I said, well, no, there's no handbook on this. We hadn't uh, really had the language prior to. We really 
uh, were new in this journey and didn't really know, um, you know, where to turn to. And, and then from that, the therapist said to us, well, you have to talk about it like you're talking about the weather. Um, and from that conversation, we were introduced to about face and then we started our journey on really normalizing facial differences and connecting with others. So I am so grateful to be part of this community as a volunteer and sharing my experiences and, and I'm looking forward to today. Okay, and I'll pass it over to you, Christine. Thank you, Annie. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's very grateful to have everyone here uh, joining us. Um, so my name is Christine De La Cruz, and I go by the pronoun she, her. I was born with Cruzon syndrome. Um, uh, so I've had a facial difference all my life ever since I was a baby. Um, I became affiliated with About Face when I was eight years old. I remember it very vividly because I remember going to an About Face event, which I didn't know what it was, um, but it was at this big hotel. Um, I met a lot of other kids who were similar to I was, made a lot of friends who I now still call my, my second family, basically. Um, and that's where my parents also got like a lot of um, useful information. And they found, they met other parents who were also raising kids who had facial differences. So it was a very, um, life-changing moment, I would say, when I um, went to that um, event um, back when I was eight. Um, from that, I started going to Camp Trailblazers um, every year. And then I started volunteering for camp, uh, both in person and then virtually as well. And in my spare time, I like to give back to About Face by volunteering um, for different events or for sitting in on different virtual events that we may have. And right now, my current role with About Face is I'm a representative on the constituency committee, and I'm also in the peer-to-peer -peer program as well. And thank you so much for joining us today. All right, so I think we're just going to dive right into our questions. Uh, so we've got a list of questions and what we're going to do is just kind of have a conversation um, to, to talk about these. And of course, any more um, questions, we're happy to go over them at the end, or we might even have some notes that, uh, that come up. So one of the first questions we, I know I've had this conversation and you know, um, we all touched on it in our introductions, is why is it important to talk about facial difference as a family? Um, you know, and I know we've touched on it, but Annie, would you be able to um, start with the answer and then we'll go from there? Yeah, absolutely. So I think it is so important to talk about facial differences as a family, because really this is where your journey is gonna begin in terms of developing the language, in terms of really uh, knowing how to if you're presented when people may ask you about your facial difference or have questions about that, then you are starting the framework to develop that language and really your comfort level. And, and again, I mentioned it before and really just normalizing facial differences. And I think in having those open candid conversations with your family, uh, that's really how we, we set the stage for that. So uh, I think it's really important that everyone in the family is on the same page about how we talk about the language with facial differences. So for example, uh, my daughter, uh, Sophie has a younger brother. I have, I have a son and really, I think it's important to teach him the language too um, about her facial difference and, and really just to prepare them, prepare all of us as a family for, you know, questions that the outside world might have, or uh, just how to explain it, how to, how to, how to really normalize it. Uh, and I think if we, if we don't talk about it, then we're suffering in silence. And, um, and I don't think that there's a lot of benefits to that. And I think really too, the more that we practice uh, having these conversations, the easier it gets. So I know I mentioned kind of in my intro that talking about it like it's the weather, that, that really is what we do. We talk about uh, my daughter's facial difference the same way that we talk about maybe the color of her hair or her eyes or the weather, or what's going on. Like it, it is not for us. It's such a part of our day-to-day -day conversation that it's not this a, a big thing for us. It's just uh, it's, it's really normalized in our family. So um, I think 
again, like I mentioned, in having these conversations with family, it makes it easier to then transition to the outside world if you already have that those kind of foundational um, conversations kind of tucked in your back pocket through practicing with your family that, you know, when you're approached from somebody on in the outside who's not familiar with a facial difference that you've already um, solidified those conversations so much that it kind of comes out like second nature. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was like, I think you've covered a, a lot and I really, I really like the talking about it. Like it's the weather, right? Because oh. it is just a part of how we talk about other things in life. And I think that's the part too, where as parents, uh, you know, I really appreciate you taking the lead on that, mm. um, you know, and, and sometimes it can become this thing where, you know, well, I don't know if they look, you know, I don't know if my child knows that they look different. Right. And I know whenever I have that conversation with community members, we all know that we, we look a little different. And the reality is if we don't, someone might, someone else is going to tell us at some point. Absolutely. Um, so, so then it can be, it's also really powerful to have that in the conversation um, as well, where it's, where we have the power of, we've got the information we can share because it might happen when you're not together as a family, right? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're building those tools. And of course, I really like touching on including the whole family. Mm -hmm. So that siblings and other people no part of this and that that really that just makes it safe so and I always let people know because like yeah kids might not you know if you bring it up they might not respond right away but you're just putting it out there and mm -hmm. so the more you're you know what they know that that's a safe thing they know that it's okay to ask those questions and like you said that practicing I think is really helpful yeah absolutely yeah I agree Christine uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to that, actually. Um, Annie, you brought up a lot of really great points, and I definitely resonate with a lot of what you said as well. Um, so as a child who grew up with a facial difference, um, my family actually never really talked about it, I would say. And that's why when I was younger, I never thought anything was different. I never thought there was anything wrong or anything like that. Um, but then I guess I started noticing it more when I was in school. And then well, part of me kind of wishes that my parents had those like talk that talk with me when I was younger, right? Um, because it would answer questions. It would allow me to learn about my difference in a very safe space. I actually had that conversation with my parents actually the first night after I came back from Chill Blazers. And that was like a really like very deep conversation. I got to learn a lot, a lot about what Cruzong was. Um, and we also talked about like different strategies of how I can like explain my difference to someone or like things I can say or things, um, things I may notice like on the streets when I'm like interacting with people. So I definitely resonate with a lot of what you said, Annie, and how the family is a very um, safe space that we feel that we can like talk about things that may be bothering us when it comes to our facial difference. Also, it, it clears up the elephant in the room, I would say Absolutely. it's a really good, good thing, right? So, yes. Yeah, for sure. And I think it, it's, it's just important to really know that it, this affects every member of the family, right? And, and really having that safe space where we can all get together, we can all talk about it, talk about how this may affect uh, everybody um, and, and just really feeling safe in doing that. Yeah, and just as, as you know, um, we were talking too, even just thinking about, you know, that, that analogy of talking about the weather. And I think that also works because we can't always predict the weather mm -hmm. sometimes or like the weather prediction might be wrong. And I think sometimes we think that in order to be able to bring this conversation up to talk about uh, to talk about this topic, we need to know all of the answers. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality, I mean, you know, myself being a mental health professional who has a facial, I don't know all of the answers myself. And so I think keeping that that weather metaphor really does fit because no, you don't know all the answers. Um, and so it can be, and it can even be normalizing of like, hey, you know what? That's a good question. I don't know, but you know, who can we ask or where can we go? Is there a website we should check out? Or, you know, is there someone on our clinical team that we can ask that question? Um, because I, I know it can feel like we need to know all of those answers. And, you know, especially parents, you want to protect 
uh, your kids and you want to give them all of the right answers, mm -hmm. although I assume some folks give up on that during that why, why, why stage. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's okay if you don't know all of the answers and it's okay if it doesn't go perfectly. Um, and I think also there's not necessarily like a perfect time to, to bring it up. Maybe that's something that sometimes people are waiting for that perfect time. Um, and it's really more just a matter of, you know, starting the conversation. And I think also that trying it again, you know, opening that conversation up and, and making it normal, like, again, the weather, you know, some people, okay. I've got family members who talk about the weather way more than I want to hear about the weather. <laughs> but it also means I know that I can ask them about it. Right, absolutely. Um, all right, let's just see. And I think that we did cover most of our notes um, because we do have a, a slide and I think we did cover all of those things. And I think um, a bit, big piece, um, just to paraphrase, is that advocacy, oh, yeah. is that in talking about it, it can be a way that we can help understand other people's reactions um, as well. Um, and I think also, you know, we talked about like celebrating success, talking about the facial different, talking about our facial difference doesn't always have to happen in a medical office, mm -hmm. uh, you know, or right before going to the dentist um and all of those things um you know it can be and it can be a good thing you know if you've got to drive I mean I had to drive from our small town um to the clinic so like that was a day so there are things that you we can like celebrate successes with as well it can be it can be a good thing um and it, it can be something like I know so my facial difference changes like it, it, it changed over time or kind of as I grew into it, or even after having surgery, kind of, it took a very long time for kind of really all of the swelling to go down was over a year. And so like, you are allowed, you know, parents are allowed to say, Hey, like, actually like it's looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things are, are allowed as well. There are, there are good things, you know, and like Christine, I mean, Christine, I feel like every time you talk about um, trailblazers and different programming, your face lights up. So, uh, you know, celebrating, like you said, that that community piece and your your um, second family as well. Oh yeah, definitely. I totally relate to that for sure, one hundred percent. All right, let's move on to our second question. Which, and some of these things, we're going to find there are lots of overlaps, so we might kind of go, which is how these conversations go. So we might have some overlap and some repetition, um, but it also can be really helpful to, to build in. So question two is, how do you wish your family uh, talked about it? And I know, Christine, you touched on this a little bit in our last question, so I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add specifically to this note. Um, the thing I can add to that is I think I wish they talked about it earlier, I would say, um, so possibly uh, before I attended school, because um, in school, like my, my class, like I was never really bullied when I was in kindergarten or grade one or grade two. Um, but then obviously, like the kids in your class, they see you every day, they know who you are. But then it's the kids on the playground that you didn't know, or you didn't understand why they were pointing at you, snickering at you, or kind of like making faces. Um, so it's like little things like that. Like I thought, oh, they're just doing that to be funny, you know? So I would try to make a funny face or something, <laughs> right? Um, so I guess just having my parents talk to me a little bit about it before, like I went to school, I think it's something that I wish that um, changed, I believe, yeah. So, but every every family is different though. So some families um, prefer not to talk about it before school or they want the child to discover it on their own, like things like that. Um, so I can't really speak to that, but if there was one thing I could um, change um, is my parents talked to me about it earlier, I would say. Well, and I think one thing I thought of when you're talking about it too is like also by, you know, by the older family members, so parents and caregivers, there's, you're still giving the, the child a choice, right? They can choose to engage in that conversation or they can choose not to, or, you know, some parents I know are like, okay, we've, we've done the prep. We've talked about it together. We're on the same page. And then, you know, the kid's like, 
yeah, okay, but where's the butterfly? Like what's going on, right? Um, so, you know, I think what's really helpful is at least like we're, you're giving that choice. So your kid knows that that's okay. And I know you mentioned kind of the bullying. And I know one thing that I've heard about frequently is, you know, when it come, does come to um, people being bullied, it can turn into this thing where everybody's kind of trying to protect each other. So parents are like, well, we don't, we don't want to bring it up because, you know, if my kid's not being bullied, I don't want to know that they could be bullied. And then on the other hand, the kids are saying, well, you know, whenever, you know, I didn't want to upset my parents, you know, I, I didn't want to make them sad by knowing I was being bullied. Or it could be that they're like, I don't, we've never talked about it. I don't even know how to bring it up. Or is that piece? And I, I think, I think it is fair. Um, you know, it can be challenging, you know, whether it's a congenital facial difference, or if there's one acquired, there can be lots of different, different feelings. And so we're not saying it needs to be all puppies and rainbows and sparkles talking about it. Um, and I know some parents, you know, have to, might have to do some work. It's hard, you know, it's hard having a baby who might need to go through surgery or who you were really scared about what was going on. And it was a confusing time. So sometimes it, it is just kind of being able to talk about it together. <laughs> Poor puppy there coughing away. Yeah, I, I think that those are very valid points. And Christina, I, I would definitely agree with you that although we did have the conversation with my daughter earlier, she was around four-ish, I do wish that we it would have even been before that because she was already noticing that people were staring at her and she had already, she already knew that, that she looked different. And, um, I, I don't think it's, it's ever too early in my opinion to start that, those conversations. And, um, the other side of it is I also think it's, it's never too late. You know, we're all here for a reason and we, we're all learning now, um, that we can have these conversations. It's never too late. Um, uh, but I do agree with you, Christine. I wish that um, in hindsight, which is always 2020, that, uh, that we would have started a bit early. Yeah. And I think, um, adding to that, actually, um, also having like the resources, I think one of the reasons my, why maybe my parents didn't talk about it as earlier on is maybe they didn't know how to, that's like, exactly it. Feel difference, right. And cruisons is one of the more, cruisons syndrome is one of the more rare, uh, facial conditions out there. I think most the more common ones are like cleft, cleft lip and palate. Right. Um, the cruisons is like, it's very rare, right? So like my parents were probably still trying to figure out yes. what it was in child-friendly language and not medical terminology that we always heard at like the doctor's office or like the hospital or yeah. something. That's why I think they started becoming more open about it after they became affiliated with like about face and like, like, you know, getting more involved into kids and things like that so I think that really helped them a lot as well yeah and I think also that there can be different ways to talk about it too right so I mean now there's social media so it can be it you know other tools are hey look at these folks you know like and legitimately my family we watched a VHS video right so that was a tool that my parents used um, where like they were, you know, we were just watching it together, uh, you know, or it can be like following um, about face Instagram page or, or different things or noticing different articles, noticing different characters in movie. I mean, unfortunately, uh, it still is quite common that facial differences are um, mostly on people who are the bad guys, the villains, all of those sorts of things. But also, that's a conversation, you know, that's a conversation that I don't think I had ever noticed until the video talked about it, where it was like, oh yeah, what's the difference between like, you know, Simba's dad and the, and the bad guy. And it was like a scar and, and a dark mate, you know, like his appearance, those are, those are things that are different. So again, there are lots of different tools, watching different movies and just kind of like dropping things, you know, leaving books out, having, having books with like different um, physical differences as well. That's also another tool that can be used, right? Um, just again, we're really kind of normalizing these. I always think it is really powerful. And I know that's one of the things I find most powerful in the facial difference community is seeing um, 
other people who, even though they don't look like me, like I can identify, they look different, like, like me a little bit. So there are different ways to have these conversations versus just using words, if that makes sense. Um, I know another thing. Oh, go ahead, Christine. Oh, sorry. No. Um, I just want I just want to unmute just in case, but no, I'm good. Um, I know another thing that's really important is that validation. Um, I think sometimes not so much family met what I don't know. Sometimes family members, I find friends, other community members, strangers either. Um, they find it really important to tell me that they're okay with my facial difference. Um, which like, I have it, whether they're okay with it or not. <laughs> um, but I think sometimes like validating. So like, it's okay. Like, it's okay to feel like you look different. It's okay to maybe be self-conscious or it's okay to not know all of the answers. Um, those things are all okay. Um, I know I have definitely heard the statements of, but you're beautiful on the inside, um, which, yeah, I want to be beautiful on the inside, but like, I still want to be beautiful on the outside too. <laughs> so sometimes it is that validation. And I think, um, you know, a lot of people have talked about um, that part of listening, right? So, you know, sometimes it's in myself included. And I think I could tell you which family member I get it from where it's like, okay, I'm going to give you all the information and I'm going to get it there. And I forget the part where it's listening to how that information is being received. So it's just listening to, um, you know, child, children, um, other family members, how are they doing? How are they processing with it? Um, you know, and you can give kind of like that validation. And a lot of times, and this is actually a natural response is for adults. Um, we want to fix things. So if our child is having a hard time saying, why are those people staring? We want, well, they shouldn't be staring at you. We're not gonna go there. We want to fix it for other people, which is a totally natural state of our brain. But there are some things that we can't, we can't fix, you know, like my parents weren't able to protect me from being stared at at the grocery store, right? That was just something that was out of their control and outside of their power. So it was really, so it can be validating, like, yeah, how does it make, you know, like, how does it make you feel? I know I don't, it doesn't make me feel good. Um, so it's validating. And then it's also, you know, like talking about it realistically, right? We can't solve, you know, we can't solve, we can't fix anything. Um, I know when I was younger, I thought, well, my, I, I have to, if I, if I embrace my facial difference, then, then that means that I have to go, I don't care what anybody else thinks ever. And so I think like allowing a little bit of that, that fluidity. And like I said, even if you don't know all of the answers, like that's okay. And it's actually like really helpful when we know that other people don't know all the answers as well, I think. <laughs> all right, so let's just see if we, I think we've covered a lot of things. Is there anything else that we'd uh, like to, to add on? Um, I feel like some of these things, like I know, Christine, you talked about like talking about things on a different level, right? Talking about it on, on that deeper level. And, and, you know, I think also Annie talked about where it's practicing, right? So it's practicing. If this conversation doesn't go perfectly the same, the way you imagined it the first time, guess what? That's okay because you get another opportunity. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that actually. Um, I don't know if it was, if every family is different, like I said, but for me, um, talking about it actually after having that conversation, it actually brought me and my parents a lot closer together. I mean, we were already close to begin with, um, but I just felt like it was something that really like strengthened our relationship. And just knowing that it made me realize that I can actually talk to them about anything that was like bothering me, right? Um, anything that was bothering me regarding like my facial difference. Because I know like some friends of mine who probably can't or who don't think that their parents really understand what they're going through. Um, and even though my parents, they don't have a difference themselves, they can still listen. They still listen to me. They still like acknowledge my thoughts. They still try to um, re like, you know, help me out how um, many way that they can. And then if anything, like they, their other advice is obviously like talk to like people from about face as well. But like, just, I feel like just having that conversation really like strengthened our relationship, I feel for me and my parents. 
Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, again, I, I know, you know, we're, we've been living through a pandemic. So I know like that toxic positivity is absolutely something I know I've struggled with, even though sometimes it might come out of me at times. Um, but it is, it's okay to not be okay, if that makes sense. Um, and it's okay to give family members that, that space that, you know, um, some of us feel like we always have to be on or like I always, if I'm talking about my facial difference, it has to be really good. Um, but it's okay. There's, there's a balance. You, like we talked about before, uh, you can talk about the challenges and you can celebrate the successes, right? They don't cancel each other out. There's room for both. And that's part of life. All right. So question three, what makes it difficult or challenging to talk about it with family, friends, other people? Um, and then what makes it easier or more more comfortable so there's we've touched on some of these things that's a big question so maybe we'll just kind of try to work through it as best we can uh so annie can i ask you for some of your thoughts on things that make it more difficult or, or things that make it easier yeah i think for us what made it sometimes challenging is trying to manage other people's reactions. And uh, I know that a lot of our family members are well-intended, um, but their kind of minimization of Sophie's facial differences just really didn't land well. So again, they, and they don't have the information, um, you know, to, to know that we don't need to be fixed and uh, minimizing her facial difference doesn't actually make anybody feel better definitely doesn't make Sophie feel better doesn't make um, us feel better as a family so um, I think that has been really challenging when it comes to, to talking about it with other people other people may not feel as comfortable and as open as as our family is talking about it so um, you know just acknowledging that this is hard this is awkward this is a tough conversation to have but um, you know power through it because it's important to have those conversations um, and what makes it more easier for us, and I know Sophie has mentioned, is, is having had that family support and that practice with us. She's really mentioned that, you know, by us having that foundation and ha having those conversations beforehand, that she really has the language to, uh, to have conversation when maybe we aren't around and somebody makes mention of a facial difference. So, yeah. Yeah, those are some really great, uh, great thoughts and, and feedback, right? Uh, but I think even just, yeah, we acknowledge that this takes practice. Mm -hmm. It's a new, it's a new skill. And I think, I, I think one of the difficulties and the challenging pieces is that, um, you know, it can come with a little bit of trauma as well, right? Of, um, you know, going to the doctors maybe more than you anticipated. Uh, to go with your child or being pro like being concerned you know a lot of times um, it's just you know we don't want people we care about we don't want life to be any harder than um, than it has to be and I think sometimes also it's kind of working through our own feelings I know um, with some parents I've spoken about uh, about this too it's it's challenging where they're like well sometimes I get upset right? Like, it's hard for me to look at those baby pictures, or also where it's like, you know, um, surgery, does that mean my kid thinks that it, it's something that needs to be fixed, right? Which our medical model really does teach um, a lot of that. And so that can be so it's like, well, I don't want them to feel like there's something wrong, or there's something that needs to be fixed. So I'll just avoid it, right? Um, you know, which is definitely a strategy I'm guilty of using uh, with other things in my life as well. Um, of like, well, this is hard. So if I just don't do it, then like, maybe it'll be okay. And we never have to talk about it ever. Um, I would say it comes up. It's unavoidable. It's like the weather. It comes up. Rain is going to happen. Snow is going to, depending on where you live, we're in Canada, snow is going to happen, right? All of these different things It kind of is is inevitable um and like you like you touched on annie too is like one thing that is helpful to think about is even if it's hard to talk about at the beginning 
it will be it will get less and less difficult as time goes as as we practice so that can actually be helpful where it's like okay well that was really hard well the good news is it's not going to get hard you know the good news is you can practice and it's going to get easier like so many other things in life um anything and i think making it easier like i think also i know my family having some like having the having some of those resources and tools, some of those scripting pieces. Christine, would you be able to pick up? Yes, for sure. Sorry, your dog is so cute. That's why I can't help. <laughs> well, um, actually, a lot of the thoughts that I have actually have been already said, but yeah, I definitely think um, the, so I'm one of the people who actually doesn't really like talking about my difference, actually. Um, and like, Practicing really does help, I would say. Um, the reason I actually don't like talking about my difference a lot is it is like the discomfort, right? Like, I don't know how the other person feels. I don't know like what their thoughts are, like if they're, um, what they thought of me, if that ever changed after me telling them about my facial difference. Um, it's just those little thoughts that um, probably mean nothing, but then they come to mind. Sometimes you can't help it, right? Um, so I think that's something that's difficult for me when it comes to talking about my difference. And then also, I guess, using words that they would understand. Um, so kind of a re like changing it in a way that they understand, oh, like um, my difference makes it, very, makes it difficult for me to hear or makes it difficult for me to um, see or when I was under eat properly or things like that, right? Um, but then over time, what made it really easier was practicing. And then just having gone through like different situations where I'd had to explain my difference or talk about what Cruzan syndrome was, um, it gets better over time. Like it gets better, better in terms of like being able to explain it, being able to say it more confidently, I would say. And also like kind of putting a little bit of a positive twist on it too, as well. So even though there's like the negatives to it, um, somehow switching it over to like the positive side of it, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's what it, what makes it better for me yeah yeah and i think um you talked about kind of like using it like creating kind of your own answers and building your own vocabulary which can be dependent on the situation i know kind of talking like so for me you know um i call my hemangioma a birthmark it's not actually a birthmark like it's a benign tumor made of like extra blood tissues and fatty tissues and those sorts of things. But I find it's just easier to say birthmark. And then often people are like, oh, like a birthmark I have here. And then, you know, there's other people, you know, um, like Kareem who's involved in about face tends to, you know, uh, I think we can remember uh, sharing some more of like those medicalized terms kind of different, you know, because that was something that that worked for him and that's comfortable, right? And, and there are times too, where like I pick and choose which vocabulary you know, do I say birthmark or do I go into kind of more details, all of those things. Um, so again, also even having like different options, you know, and there can be a little bit of trial and error. As you said, Christine, like we can't control how other people respond, um, which so I think that's also probably another part that makes it challenging is like, yeah, there is some risk. There, There is some risk. And I think this is where sometimes not talking about it is a choice. I think sometimes people think that if we can, you know, being passive is actually a choice. So if you're not talking about it as a family, like that is a choice um, to not talk about it. And sometimes, you know, we kind of get that confused where it's like, well, we're not like, we're, you know, it's like, well, we're just not doing it yet. And so it's like, okay, that's like, that's a choice. So being aware um, that like, that is a decision that's, that's being made. Um, and that's the piece like, you know, we talked about being proactive. So, you know, having the conversation, you know, think about lots, you know, parents have to have lots of different conversations with their kids, um, you know, and so, hey, maybe this will make some of those different conversations a little easier because you have those practices, um, you know, or I know, like, I know my parents, a lot of conversations happened in the car. So it was when we were going to, like, I was going to a practice, something like that, because, you know, um, I mean, I didn't have a cell phone at that time. So, you know, we're not, we're not facing each other, which can sometimes be actually a really helpful uh, tool kind of takes away the intensity. I can look out the window while I'm talking and also 
also we have a destination. So I know that this conversation isn't going to go on forever and ever and ever. Um, and like, also, you know, there's going to be something else. Like I'm going to get to basketball practice or choir practice or whatever. And that's where my brain is, is going to focus. So, you know, I know that was a strategy my family used was those car, you know, those, um, car trips and because it is it's kind of private as well um you know and it not all of these conversations are like gather around family let's sit at the table uh you know these can happen while you're like shooting hoops while you're fishing you know while you're doing other activities as well um it doesn't have to be a formal conversation i guess um, all right, and let's just see. We had a couple notes. I think we've covered most of these. You know, acknowledging these can be challenging, and that piece being proactive. Um, so instead of waiting for, you know, sometimes it's like, well, my child doesn't know that they're different. Um, so instead of waiting for the child to discover that they're different, we can actually be proactive and have that conversation about differences, um, which does give us a lot more power and control in those scenarios versus it could come up on that day when like, you know, there's a hundred different things going on and you're cooking. And, you know, I think we've all had those days where it's like, my brain just does not have the capacity um, for this. So being proactive means that we can do it kind of on our own time. All right, on to question four. So when should you talk to your child about their facial difference? Um, is it ever too early or is it ever too late? And I think, Christine, can I, I've already forgotten which order I've been asking <laughs> you to. <laughs> so can I ask you to start on your thoughts to this question? Of course. Um, so in my mind, I think that it's never, it's never too early and it's never too late, I would say. Um, I feel like it, every family is different and every individual is different. Um, and then it's also based on their feelings and also like their comfort level, right? Um, so for me, I don't know if there's ever really a right time to talk about a facial difference. Um, every person is different. Like for me, for example, like I would prefer it if my parents have talked to me about it like um, like earlier, right? When I was like a younger girl, like before starting kindergarten, but I'm still very grateful and still very happy that they did talk about it, even if it was like later on in my elementary years when I was around like eight or nine, um, cause at least the conversation still like happened and we still talked about it. We still like brought up our feelings, we shared our thoughts. Um, and I think maybe now that I think about it, maybe having it at an older age, like, like an older age, I feel like maybe it was even better because it got me to understand like what was going on in a situation and my facial difference and um, the outcomes of having a facial difference and such like that. Um, but at the same time, if they had it earlier, it probably would have also prepared me for like school and the things that could have happened at school or like on the playground or anything that could happen. Yeah, so for me, there's no real answer to this, to this I would say. It's very, um, very open because there's never really a time that's too early or time that's too late, I would say. I have some friends who found out about their facial difference in their adult years, even like not even having to talk to family members, but just found on their own, right? So it really depends um, on who the person is. Yeah, that's my thoughts. Yeah, I think that's great. And like you said, there's not a perfect time. Yeah. Um, and that also means there's not like there's there. It's not like there's an expiry date for when you can no longer. Um, and, and one point as well is is really you can have the conversation at different times. Right. So you can have a con like, you know, I'm sure, Annie, the conversations that you've had with your family is different when your daughter was four versus now when she's older. Right. So that can be an important part is like using you know, the appropriate developmental words speaking kind of at, at their language as well. So, you know, it could just be adapting um, to your, your child's age and needs. And you might even have conversations. So the conversations might be different with, uh, you know, like a younger and older sibling. You're prob you might be using different words. And I think that's okay in the same way that we kind of tailor different things to other people in our family all the time. 
All right, and I am aware of time. Is there anything else? And I think we maybe have a few more notes on the slide. Is there anything else? Uh, yeah, and right there, Christine got the first line right away. Um, you know, and I think being that open and, and honest, right? Uh, ironically, we use the term like at face value, right? But, uh, you know, being just being realistic, and this is where it takes time to listen to each other as well. All right, so as an adult, how can I talk about my facial difference? Um, so I guess this is kind of a, an open question. We have we have talked to you know some of it is also we talked about practicing it, uh, you know having different conversations. I think Christine, you talked about having different conversations, and you might have. I know I personally have very different conversations with people I know who have um, facial differences or other differences than I I do with with friends who might not. I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten more confident. Uh, you know, and I've, I've noticed the, the pieces where, um, you know, where I will tell people, well, it's important to validate, you know, when you get the well-meaning like, oh, but it doesn't matter. I didn't, I don't notice. Or, you know, well, I've been self-conscious of my freckles too. And again, I'm not invalidating other people's experience. Um, but there have been times where, you know, I have told those well-meaning people and I said, you know what, when you tell me it's not a big deal like you are discounting my entire experience uh you know and when you say it shouldn't matter or it shouldn't bother me like you make me feel like it's all in my head when i notice people staring at all of those things which is absolutely something that um you know again it took time and practice as as an adult um, I think I know I tend to, I still do use about face as a tool uh, to bring up my facial difference. Uh, so, and again, I often, I bring it up um, sometimes. And so it, it's not necessarily that I'm like, <laughs> that I'll say, oh, I have, you know, did you, did you all notice my birthmark? But it might come up where it's like, oh, you know what? Like, I was a patient at Sick Kids when I was a kid, right? Or, you know, like I've volunteered and I've worked at Camp Trailblazers, which is for people with facial differences. I find a big thing I bring up um, is when I talk about movies. And so there are some movies that I choose not to watch because of how people with facial differences are portrayed. So I bring it up on kind of like my terms um, and also kind of like as an educational uh, point, you know, of like, did you ever notice that like the bad guys almost always have a scar? Uh, and a lot of people are surprised, like a lot of adults are very surprised by that, that information, but that's a way where I'm talking about facial differences, but not necessarily about just me, if that makes sense. Uh, Christine, do you have any other thoughts on strategies that you or other folks in your life use? Yes, actually, so a lot of the things that you mentioned actually was very relatable because I was like, oh yeah, I was trying to think lots of times that I had uh, situations like that as well. Um, the model that I always go with, I would say, is like if it's um not within the facial difference community or if it's not within like my like my close friend group or family, I say short and sweet. So like I say, oh, I have Cruzan syndrome and this, and then I just leave it at that. And then, um, if it's something that like, you know, like within the facial difference community, for example, that I'm a little bit more open about talking about it. And then I also like talk about how it affected me, I would say. Um, but being like talking about it with the facial difference community really is where I'm the most open about my difference, I would say. Um, um, outside of that, I'm not as like willing to talk about it. Um, just my personal, my personal choice and my personal preference. Um, my close friends, they all know about it. And funnily enough, actually, one of the ways they found out was through my mention of about face. So I remember when I was in grade 10, I told my friends, I'm casually going for camping for three days. And they're like, where are you going? I'm like, oh, um, I'm going to about face for three days for um, this camp for kids with facial differences. And they're like, but you don't have a face. Like, what are you talking about? And then that opened up like the door for conversation. And like, that's where I like talked about like, you know, what I had my entire life. And then 
Yeah. So like things like that, like about face, I still use it as well as like a tool to like kind of start the conversation. Um, so I'm not directly saying I have um, Cruzan syndrome, but I'm saying, oh, like about face is something I'm part of and this is why. And then it's kind of easing into it, I would say. That's what I do. Yeah. So. Exactly. And I think recognizing too, where you're like, I have a choice of how much I say. And there might be some days where I don't feel like talking about my facial difference. And, and that's, that's okay. I think that actually this question leads into our, our final question, um, which is uh, our final question is, what are some ways that we talk about facial difference and what are examples of how you've talked about it? Um, so Annie, would I be able to hear a couple of your thoughts and examples that you've used? Yeah. Um, and I know we've touched on several things already. Absolutely. So, I mean, we tend to just keep it pretty simple. Uh, no matter the age or the you know developmental uh, age of the person so um and it, we i don't so much use humor for it uh sophie might as she kind of continues on but we just keep it like she was born with clipophile syndrome and part of that means that her face looks a little bit different and it's something that she was born with and we just really keep it basic um if people choose to ask more questions about it then we'll get into it but um, in terms of using some of the language and um, kind of breaking it all down, it can get kind of overwhelming. So for, for us, that's what, uh, what we do. And everybody in the family seems to, um, you know, know some version of that very simple explanation. Clip, she's born with clipophile syndrome. It's genetic. Um, and, and, and part of that is facial differences. And then that's that. And just in, in hearing you talk, I think one thing too, um, you know, that was something that I wasn't necessarily aware of, but, uh, you know, often I discover that people will ask other people in my life before they ask me because right. they don't want to be rude. They don't want to upset me. Like when I'm like, uh, <laughs> I'm over 30, I know what my face looks like. Right. Um, but, but like you said, so it's the siblings, right? Like my yeah. sister probably, you know, explained it more often uh, than I did or equally as often as a child because people would ask her, right? So it's it's often the same way we talk about um, kids practicing, then it can be also be like supporting those other family members or those other friends. I know I've had lots of friends, you know, or even like teammates where, you know, I remember chatting with one of my team captains and you know, it came up and she was like, yeah, actually a bunch of people asked me. And I was like, oh, well, glad we had this conversation, like after a year of us being on the same team. Um, but I think also being aware of these conversations can make it, it helpful for, for other folks because then, yeah, it turns in where, you know, I, I don't know how many people are wondering. Um, and also, you know, as Christine said too, like, yeah, sometimes also like I, I don't, I don't need to answer. I think one of my favorite that like, I absolutely learned this from a youth was like, I just tell people to Google it. You know, like I don't have the time and energy. I don't feel like explaining every detail. If they are that concerned, they can use their phone and they can look it up. Also like sometimes humor a little bit, um, you know, picking and choosing what you want to say. I also know some people who have given in, you know, They've said, well, I got in a fight. That's not what happened. But that's what they wanted to share in the moment. And, and that's their choice. Mm -hmm. Christine? Yeah. Um, it's funny about the fight one. <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm picturing who it is right now. Um, but like for me, I don't really use humor as much. But um, I remember when I was younger, um, a strategy that was taught to me um, was like, when somebody asks you what is wrong with your face, um, do you kind of go back at them and say, what is wrong with your face? And then it kind of like takes them back by surprise. I would say, so that's the closest thing to humor that I can think of. Um, yeah, but I don't know, some examples of how I talk about it, I just like say, um, oh, I was born with it and that's it, you know? <laughs> like I kind of keep it, like I said before, like short and sweet. Um, and then if they really have like more questions, um, I choose whether or not to answer it. Most of the time I know, because I don't like to go beyond that. Um, but seeing like I was born with it, sometimes usually like you know, kind of makes it like, okay, we're good. Let's end the conversation now type thing. Yeah. So something that I actually use a lot in my, in my career actually is what I do, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And we don't have to, you know, like 
yeah, for example, I don't give people accurate information. I mean, I'm not real, you know, where I'm like, it's a birthmark. No, I wasn't actually like, it wasn't there when I was born, but also, you know, that's, that's a quick response. Uh, right. And it's also, it's, it's tangible. People, people understand, they know what a birthmark means. Um, you know, um, whereas I can say like a benign tumor and sometimes I do. Uh, so it can be really, it can be situational. And I think that means like also where, where we are, like, um, you know, am I feeling safe? Am I by myself? those sorts of things. And also where I am like emotionally, uh, do I have time to dig into this? Do I have the energy, you know? Cause also it can say, you know what? Like it's none of your business as well. There are all sorts of, of different, different options, um, you know? And that's, that's a piece where we cannot control how other people respond, but like we do have the ability to control how we talk about things. Yeah, and just to add to that, I know something that I've been using a lot lately, actually, in the classroom, because I'm a teacher, um, is the whole idea of, like, diversity and inclusion, and how, like, everybody is, um, is different, right? Like, whether it's different in terms of, like, their looks, in terms of their skin color, in terms of, like, um, how, like, their height, um, in terms of, like, even, like, their facial difference or how their facial features, right? So just kind of making it, like, an educational piece, I would say, is another strategy that I like to rely on, especially if it's, like, younger, like, in younger students or, like, younger kids, I would say. Yeah. I think I often did, like, the flip that you're describing where, like, I would, I'd, like, ask my teachers to be, like, I don't know how to spell hemangioma. Do you know how to spell hemangioma? <laughs> so it was like almost, it was like a passive aggressive education, I guess. Um, and also it turns out like there's multiple different spellings, so it actually doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but kind of like, and that that is a way too of like, again, asking those questions. Um, another thing we had talked about too is kind of, sometimes we also don't know these answers. And so to, you know, it can be like talking to, um, our care team. I find the medical model sometimes uses the language uh, that they are used to using. And, you know, like, I know when I was going to my craniofacial team, it was a long day, you know, you'd be waiting in the waiting room, and then you'd go in and you'd get 15 minutes and like, you know, they'd throw information at and then you'd kind of walk out and go, what, like, what? So sometimes it is kind of having those prepared questions, uh, you know, and you can ask, well, you know, what are our different, different ways, you know, in, in understanding, I think probably the reason that I call my hemangioma like extra blood and fatty tissue is because one of my doctors explained it to me that way, right? Or else they explained it to my parents and then they explained it uh, to, to me, right? So it can be, you know, it's gathering gathering the different information again and then having the the choice of i i call it i call it practicing i call it my back pocket response so that it means um because there are still times you know i spend a lot of time talking about facial differences with about face and in other roles in my life and just being who i am being a, a community member so i have the answer available in my back pocket because if i have you know if i'm caught off guard uh you know where I'm not expecting it like I'm at the beach or like a photo shoot for my team I'm not really I, I'm not surprised by it I just go to my back pocket response of like oh it's a birthmark and I don't even it's automatic so like I walk away and I don't really I don't really even have to think about it right um so I found that's been really helpful just having something automatically there um, I think we have a few notes, so maybe we'll just see if we've covered anything. And is there anything, Annie or Christine, that you'd like to add? I think we talked a lot about like practice. I know some parents have also like they you've done role play, right? You can do role play, so like you can make it fun, you can make it silly, where you can do like the like tell me as fast as you can, or like having that elevator pitch, right? Or like you know tell me when you're sad, when you're happy, like do some acting, all sorts of, all sorts of different things. So, uh, you know, and like practice different things, like at Trailblazers, we would sometimes do different games where we practice making eye contact, right? And so, you know, then that could lead into practice making eye contact when we answer these questions, all of those things. So that's a big thing that, that really came up and, and yeah, just talking about it, like you talk about the weather. 
It can be short, it can be a long conversation. All right, well then I guess that concludes, uh, that concludes all of the questions. Um, hopefully as we've demonstrated, there's not real, you know, like right, wrong answers, perfect timing, all of those different things. Um, you know, everybody has different experiences and it's, a, it's about the conversation um, as much as it's about the answer, I think. Are there any final notes that we'd like to add? All right, well, thank you so much that I really appreciate. And I, I always find I learn a lot from these conversations, right? Uh, you know, uh, different, different strategies, different experiences as well. Uh, you know, where we have, you know, I might have commonalities and, and also some very different experiences as well. But I really appreciate And hey, if, if you're not sure how to have this conversation and you're watching this webinar, then like, that's a pretty fantastic first start. So I think you're doing great. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much to our panelists, Christine, Annie, and Colleen for being here today. This was recorded and it will be available online at a later date. Thank you to everyone who was able to attend and you will be having a survey land in your inbox shortly to receive and give any feedback that you have for us on this webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thanks everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks.